Okay, thanks for coming back. I'm the almost last one between you and uh, Allison's talk. Uh, my name is Martin uh, Hilgeman. I'm from Dell. Uh, I do work as an HPC consultant and uh, today I'm not going to talk about Dell hardware but rather about what the real challenges are for us as hardware vendors. So it will be software only because we believe that if you are all using the same components and we all are using more or less the same microprocessors as uh, Intel is still the dominating party we are still using the same kind of interconnects in terms of bandwidth and accelerators well how are you going to make a difference and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in this talk and the thing is, if you want to differentiate uh, true performance, because we are talking about high performance computing here, then, like I said, everybody has to say microprocessors. We also know, know that Moore's law is still going on, but we do not get more cores. We do not get um, faster cores, but we only get more cores, right? So there's something that we need to do. And actually, that means that we as users and developers need to make our hands dirty in order to get good performance out of our systems. So then it comes down to uh, two important charts, you can say. We have um, Moore's law here on the left, I think all very familiar to you. And I, it's a bit small, I think, for most of you um, in the audience, but you still see that this line, which is the number of transistors, uh, is still increasing linearly. So every 18 months, we are still getting double the amount of transistors. Um, if you look at the other graphs, then you see that we are hitting a ceiling. So that's for the single thread performance, for the frequency of all the cores, for the total power consumption that we can put on a single socket, it's hitting a ceiling. And we see that the number of cores is still somewhat increasing, right? So we get more transistors, but the performance per core is staying the same, more or less. You see here on the right that we have Endel's law, and Endel's law tells you something about the parallel efficiency, right? If you have a parallel workload, then your ultimate scalability is being determined by the serial fraction in your application. So if you have a certain serial fraction, then you are guaranteed that you will not be able to scale above a certain um, scalability number. Here I have the uh, parallel efficiency and here the number of cores and these three graphs are three if this thing is working it are your yeah, three efficiency numbers and if you look at the lower uh, red graph that's 50% efficient and what I mean with that is that if you have 32 cores then a scalability of 16x is 50% efficient. And what you then can see, if you want to get a 50% efficiency in terms of scalability out of your application, if you want to use 128 cores, which are uh, not very many systems nowadays, then your application needs to be above 99% parallelized. So that's the obvious message. We have to parallelize our application. Then you can say that we have some kind of problem because Moore's law says, well, you do still get more cores because you get more transistors. But meanwhile, Endel says that you cannot use them all efficiently because of your serial fraction. So we have some kind of a bottleneck here. So for Dell, uh, but also for other system vendors, we have a challenge here because uh, customers expect us to sustain a certain performance trajectory um, for new systems without massive increases in terms of price, power consumption, uh, the size of the system and the reliability obviously. I mean it has to be reliable and performance wise very good and otherwise it will not be competitive. So if you talk about how can we design a system uh, using this, then we don't have a single answer, but we do have various tuning knobs. We have the frequency, but that's, like I said, it is uh, <coughs> around 2 point something gigahertz for the E5 processor. We can differentiate to the number of cores that we have on a socket. Well, that's still increasing. We can put more sockets on the board, or the cores themselves can be more powerful. 
right? They can probably retire more instructions or marker ops in a single clock cycle per core. That's all being determined, these four, by the hardware performance itself. The last one is the efficiency. That's the ultimate multiplier, and that's being determined in software, right? It's all the way from the operating system to the actual application that you're running, you can say. If we then turn the knobs and we start at knob 1, then we know that the frequency will not change much, right? We have a challenge. If we, if we bump the frequency higher, then we have a, a thermal issue in terms of power consumption and we have also current leakage on, on the system boards. So that's not likely to be changed. We still see uh, that we get more cores, right? More law is still valid. Um, the first Intel uh, core microarchitecture processor was, was being built using 130 nanometers. We are now down to 14 and we will get to 10 eventually, right? So still lots of transistors. The number of sockets, that's the easy one to increase, you would say. But it's challenging because systems will get larger. Um, they will be it, it, it will be challenging in terms of power consumption and density, and also the networking can become a bottleneck because you still have a single network card going outside of the system. We know that the number of instructions per cycle is growing, so the Intel Haswell microarchitecture um, does have two extra execution units compared to previous generations, so that's increasing. At the same time, um, new processors and are, are getting new capabilities in terms of factor units or advanced instructions, and we also have accelerators, for example, that can uh, offload certain workloads. So that's probably something where we can gain something, but at the same time, if you want to use those instructions, then the, the, the software has to be aware of, of those. So you, as a developer, has to uh, port your application in order to use those instructions. So what is Intel saying us? Well, you have seen this uh, a lot of times, so I will not spend too much time on this slide. But we have the TikTok uh, way of uh, with developments where a talk is a change in um, new microarchitecture and a tick is then a die shrink on the same microarchitecture. Uh, so we're, we are now here with Intel Broadwell and we will get to Skylake uh, somewhere next year uh, probably uh, having a new microarchitecture on the same 40 nanometer process. These e processors also became more powerful in terms of the type of instructions that they support. The um, first Intel Core processor did support SSC2, then it became SSC4 with the Halim and the Westmere. With Sandbridge, we got AVX. We are now, in terms of Intel Broadwell, uh, we are now using AVX2 which is also some kind of basis for Knight's Landing, which is using AVX 512 in uh, well, various uh, types. And for Skylake, it will be AVX 512 as well. But if we look at ISV software, for example, because that's obviously where um, the performance has to come from, because we are not interested in processors, but we're interested in applications, then you can see for various your segments that the uh, type of factorization that it you supports, so I just equal now factorization to the ability to use the instructions, it is limited. So for CFD, where the accuracy of, uh, of, uh, of the solver, also for CSM, where accuracy is key, you see very little support for factorization because they are very scared that the accuracy of the model will change. Yeah, well for weather it's different because all the weather codes are more or less open so therefore very easy to adopt to <coughs> new technologies um, and the well, nature of the code is also very suited to uh, well factorization. For oil and gas, it's a bit mixed because your seismic processing there it's not very ap applicable, but in uh, uh, reservoir simulation it is, for example. In gamma 3, using orbital methods, generally not because the vector lengths are not big enough. 
for molecular dynamics, you do see a lot of support for new instructions. So you can see that it really, really differs uh, in terms of uh, applications. Then what we see also is that the bandwidth per processor is suffering in, in various types. What I have here in this graph are for various processor generations are the something point ninety processors. So I have the Westmere 5690, which is my baseline, and then I have the uh, Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, Haswell, and Broadwell processor. And then you can see that the number of cores uh, for that certain processor is still in, uh, increasing. So that's our Moore's law, you can say. But if you look at the clock speed, it is becoming slightly slower for every generation. Uh, if you look at the QPI bandwidth, it was increasing because uh, we, get, we got an extra QPI link for Sandy Bridge, and since then it has become less. And for the memory bandwidth, same thing, right? We got uh, the memory controller on the board here with uh, Sandy Bridge, and then it got down <laughs> slower and slower and slower. But we also know, because of big data, that the data itself is uh, becoming sparser, right? And this is a very common operation where you have a matrix A, which is sparse in nature, will be multiplied by a factor X, yielding the factor Y. So if you have a sparse matrix, that means that most of your entries are zero. And what well, zero means, no computation at all, you can say. So it's hard to exploit uh, well factorization here. And therefore, it's also because there are a lot of zero entries. That means that your data is actually scattered across the memory of your, of your system. And therefore, it is hard to make efficient use of uh, your processor cache. So it has low arithmetic density and therefore it's memory bound because you are not uh, using the cache very common. Uh, this is very common in ECFD but also in other areas. Um, I had also complaints from uh, well, bioinformatics which were looking at uh, your genes, uh, you're looking at the genetic evaluation of species who said well we have a big data memory bound problem so it is becoming more and more every day. And my slide is Intel only, more or less, because that's what we are currently doing at Dell, so it's mainly Intel. And then the question is, what does Intel do about this? And I don't want to be an Intel basher, but what they're actually doing is that for each of those problems, in terms of bandwidth in the QPI, but also for the memory and the frequency, for each generation, then if we have our baseline, which was fine, more or less, like I showed you, you do get more of those tuning ops in hardware. You do get um, more ESTUD modes if you talk about cache each time. You do get larger caches or extra load store units, and you do get new instructions, right? So you get more and more um, tuning ops that you can play with as a user and developer in order to get good performance out of your system. Meanwhile, if you look at the trends of the systems themselves, then you can say for a lot of time we had a very stable baseline in terms of a big iron system, right? We had processors that were all sharing a memory bus to the uh, uh, I.O. controller here that was attached to either a network card here and then we had a, uh, a CPU that was connected, um, sorry, right, yeah, sorry, we had a memory controller and memory was connected to that memory controller. So each CPU had the same access to either the network or memory. So it was looking very, very uh, easy. Then with the introduction of multi-core, it was more or less the same, although uh, suddenly the, we had more cores on the same processor die, sharing some cache, but for the rest it was the same. We had the IO hub here and the memory controller here, right? This was 2005. Then in 2007, with Yosemite Bridge, we had all of a sudden the integrated memory controller. So the memory controller became on the chip, 
which means that our architecture all of a sudden became fragmented because we had two memory domains um, where we had each CPU controlling its own memory. The cores on this processor can talk to this memory, obviously, but it has to go over the QPI link to the memory controller on this socket. So you have an overhead and then therefore a, a bandwidth limitation and you have some extra latency. From a networking point of view or a PCI point of view, it was still uniform because that was separate. Then it became even more integrated with, with the Sandy Bridge processor because the PCI controller became part of the CPU socket. So we had one additional level of integration and therefore one additional level of non-uniformity, you can say, because the InfiniBand card or the GPU, for example, became non-uniform to all cores on the system. And that more or less became worse and worse because we uh, for Intel do get the uh, integrated fabric adapter for example and that, that then becomes on the chip. Or for the future where we have for example hybrid designs where we have traditional cores and some kind of accelerator on the same chip. So you have uh, Intel designs doing this but you also have ARM designs doing this, right? So it is becoming more and more integrated which make us think as though, well, should we perhaps uh, revisit the whole concept of a server where previously the CPU was the central part, but you now see that that CPU is not only about calculations, but it is talking about more things. It's the enabler to the outside world, you can say, either through uh, a network card or to a GPU or to memory or other devices. So it's something that is well, keeping us busy. If you want to predict performance, then uh, an alternative way, uh, instead of your standard flops and cycles, is the roofline model. And what you do there with the roofline model is that you speak about uh, system performance in terms of bandwidth to memory and the arithmetic density of your workload. So for memory bound, you obviously talk about uh, well, gigabytes per second or how many bytes you actually transfer for your calculation. And then for arithmetic density, it's the amount of flops that you do on that byte that you transfer to memory. If we start here, yeah, BLAST3 or particle methods, so this is your lint pack, then we know that it is very arithmetically dense and um, we are not transferring many bytes to memory because it's very cache friendly. So that's very efficient. But we have, for example, phosphate transforms or less or uh, lattice Boltzmann methods, which or yeah, or with stencil methods, which are very common in uh, reservoir simulation, which are not that arithmetically dense but very memory bound. That's the other side of the spectrum. The way that you um, plot such a roof line is as follows. So you can think of this line as being a roof line. And what you have here on the vertical axis is the amount of gigaflops per second that you get out of your workload. <laughs> and here on the horizontal axis, that's your arithmetic density. So the number of flops per byte that you uh, uh, do. This is your peak memory bandwidth. It's the uh, for for my system, which is a uh, uh, Broadwell processor. It's around 128 gigabytes per second. So this is my peak. And in terms of uh, well computation, this is my floating point peak, which is around one teraflop for a dual socket system. So if my so. If my workload is here, then we say it is compute bound. If it's here, which means very low arithmetic density, but very high up here, then it is memory bound. So the way that you optimize is, if you optimize to better use of caches, then, you, then your arithmetic density increases and you make less use of the memory bandwidth. So it's becoming more compute bound. And if you are here, then through micro-optimization, you can increase uh, 
the performance in total and therefore it is going up in the slope. So you can say, well, this is where my performance more or less should be. But we have NUMA overhead, which means that our performance is less than the total memory bandwidth. So we cannot reach this up, uh, all the way up to here, but it is, it is probably slightly lower. <coughs> then, if we are using Hassel processors, but also, for example, other processors that do support the uh, floating point multiply add instruction, if we are not able to use the FMA, then we only get half the uh, floating point peak performance. And this is a logarithmic scale, but see, it's half of my floating point peak, so I'm only here. Then, it can even be worse, because if I cannot use factorization at all, then that becomes uh, another factor of uh, four lower compared to where I was and then I'm only able to get up to here with my performance. So you see there are a lot of steps that you need to master in order to get very good performance. So if we put it all together, then if I start with my memory bandwidth benchmark, which is Estream Triad, then I'm somewhat here, right? I'm right on, on where I and for Enuma system, this is what I measured myself. It is not very arithmetically dense because of the triad, but you see that I am utilizing my full memory bandwidth. HPCG is also very memory bandwidth driven. It is uh, not using OpenMP, it is hybrid, uh, so, so somewhat OpenMP, and, but it is more memory local than stream triad, so I am getting more bandwidth out of here and it's more aromatically dense. Linpack is all the way here, obviously. I missed that, yeah, that one. And you see for other ones, and I, and I measured a few applications, see it uh, differs and you also see where I expect that my sparse solvers will be. So very low in terms of uh, total system utilization, you can say, although my system appears to be 100% busy, but just to put some things in uh, perspective. So what can we do to optimize our software? Well, we have various ways in order to tune. So we can start with the hardware to uh, we're changing BIOS options, for example. We can set uh, very snoop modes here, or we can change processor P states, for example. In the operating system, we can change the I/O layer, uh, the way that the cache is behaving, or we can set a process affinity for various cores, which will alter the memory allocation of my program, yielding more performance. One step up, which is already harder, is where we tune the middleware layer. So that can be the MPI layer, if we are talking about uh, distribute, distributed memory parallelism. Or we can use performance libraries like uh, Intel MKL, for example, if we are doing linear algebra. Uh, algebra or, or we can use uh, an uh, optimized library for fast Fourier transforms. Various things that we can use in order to get better performance. If you want to get the best performance, then you have to change your application, but that's obviously the hardest thing to do. You can insert compiler hints to help the compiler to generate more optimal code, or you can change the source code directly or add extra parallelism hints in your application in some ways in order to get that um, MLS law biting you uh, better. So one slide about affinity. Um, if you have a hybrid OpenMP, uh, MPI MP open location, and you don't set affinity correctly, then your threads will scatter all across the machine. So this is a four socket machine. Each color is an MPI rank, which with its uh, corresponding OpenMP threads. So you see that they, that they are scattered all across the system and therefore memory access will not be uniform and a lot of traffic will occur. If you use a program that I wrote which will set the affinity 
correctly and it will look at the system that you have automatically it will look at the number of threads that you will use and the number of MPI ranks then it will place it as intelligently as possible so you don't need to make your hands dirty the application will will figure it out all by itself and therefore place everything on one socket if possible and you see that you do get a performance jump also, you can outperform uh, the affinity settings in MPI libraries if you do, if you are doing it more clever, then you can even get your speedups using ISV applications. It's also able to well, tune the middleware, and therefore, what I have done is I wrote an uh, MPI profiling interface called Dell Toolbox. What it does is that it uh, intercepts all the MPI calls that you're doing and then measures um, the message sizes, it measures the time that it takes to uh, complete the message. It can even model uh, ideal interconnects and therefore you tell you something about uh, what your overhead is in terms of, uh, of, of uh, interconnects, so not only the MPI layer. And it generates comma-separated files that you can import into Excel if you do that, then you get your graphs like this. So you have the walk up time here and the MPI rank uh, here. And then you have the amount of time being spent in the application uh, on the bottom. So you see there is some variation per MPI rank. And then you have for each MPI rank the uh, amount of time being spent in each MPI function. So then you can very easily see what is actually um, causing the most uh, time in, in my walk clock time in terms of MPI. It also then tells you something about the uh, well, message sizes, so what kind of messages are being sent the most, so you can generate graphs like this. And in terms of total messages, um, which uh, MPI function was sending the most messages and what can I do about this. Once you have this knowledge and you apply this to an application, then you can start tuning. So this is what I did for Ultra Hyperworks, uh, Ultra Radios actually, um, based on the information that I got, so this is my application time, you see it is not, not, not very efficient, we had a lot of overhead, but I was able to change the InfiniBand protocol here, whether it was using the Eager protocol or the, or the Rendezvous protocol um, offset. And later on, I was able to uh, alter the MPI broadcast uh, function that was being used. And if you do that very easily, you can still get a very nice performance boost for nothing, for not changing the application, but just doing more, more clever things. So I will uh, end with uh, two optimization examples. The first uh, case study is around uh, well, 3D anti-leakage FFTs. These, these, um, these are being used in uh, seismic processing. This is uh, some work that I did for a oil company in the Middle East. And what they do with seismic processing is that they uh, use seismology uh, to estimate the, the, the properties of the Earth's surface and underneath everything by looking at the reflection of the seismic waves that they put into the surface. So, depending on what's underneath the surface, you will get a certain spectrum with some kind of time offset, right? Um, and that spectrum will be different in terms of frequency, Right, so higher frequency or lower frequency based on what's underneath and the time offset uh, where, where they will reflect, yeah, when they will reflect or not. You can then uh, write it differently in either your frequency space or time space using a fast Fourier transform and as we know as high performed computing scientists that's very computer, compute intensive so that's probably something we would look into. What I used for uh, this uh, exercise was the uh, Intel um, factorization advisor, which can 
tell you something about the application hotspots and the most time-consuming loops in your application. It can tell you something about uh, the data dependencies. It can tell you something about um, what hints you should uh, do or sh well, should perform in order to get better performance. So with new compilers, it actually gives you some ideas uh, what to change. So this is a profile. It's very hard to read, I think, from the outside. But what you should remember is my yeah, starting point was that uh, the factorization advisor told me that it was for 76% executing scalar code, so non-factorized code. The other 23% the other was factorized. So as we just learned, not very efficient. It also told me that two routines were uh, making up for the majority of the walk lock time. So obviously I had very easy targets to look at, only two places. For reliability, I left out the uh, what was source changes, but what it was telling me that I was having unaligned access. So my uh, loops were not aligned on a memory boundary and therefore the uh, compiler could not use an aligned instruction but an unaligned instruction which is always less efficient than an uh, aligned instruction. At the same time when you do a loop that means if it's not aligned that it has to do a remainder which is generally not aligned and not factorizable so it is less efficient. What you should remember here is that this was the original compiler output which says if I factorize then I get a performance speed up of uh, 6.3 after my changes where I fix that alignment I got a performance speed up of factor due to factorization of 9 so you can say 50% better for this. They were also doing type conversions so you have a single precision value and you want to assign that to a double position value or other way around. That means that the compiler has to promote a, a single position value to a double position value, which is uh, expensive as we call it. It is time consuming. And the compiler also said that, well, I have to do a lot of floating point up converts and at the end I have to do my down converts. When I fix those, then you can see that I also get a speed up and far less type converts, therefore more efficient. The application itself was what they called embarrassingly parallel. So it had a main loop that allocated all the arrays and it was handing out uh, windows containing um, seismic waves to cores. You can say very efficient because each window was independent of the others, so very little overhead. But they forgot the memory allocation because there was one thread who did all the memory allocation and then handed out the windows, which means that the memory allocation is all local to the core doing that memory allocation. So if we have, when we have our dual socket system, what happens is that the memories of all the other cores will actually, all, uh, all the arrays of the other cores, sorry, will end up on the memory domain of my core doing the allocation, which means that for this socket, everybody has to go through the QPI bus and then through the memory controller of the other socket. So, so I fixed this because it's very easy to fix. Um, you just have to do the memory allocation in a parallel loop and to uh, fill them, that memory, which is what we call first touch. So once you allocate and you fill, then it's your memory. Yeah. And when you do this, then all of a sudden it uh, will become uh, local to each processor, which means that you will get better performance and less of overhead. If we now combine it all together, where well, this is the optimized version, then you see instead of 23% factorized, it's now 76% factorized. So it's the exact opposite of where we started. And my scalar code is not indeed 76, but only 23%. 
these are the final results by doing this. This was only three days of work, so a, a lot of uh, a lot of low-hanging fruit. On various architectures, we got uh, a speed up of approximately 24 to 28 percent on old compilers. They were using the Intel 12 compilers, who do support AVX2, but at the time those compilers were released, there was no Haswell-based hardware. So with later compilers, obviously we got much better performance. When we used the FMA instruction, we even got better performance, but we had an issue because our results changed. What happens here, and it's, it, it's not in this presentation, but if you look at the FMA, what you do is that you do a addition and a multiplication in a single instruction, and you round off after that instruction to your desired precision. So you round off once. On all the architectures, older architectures, you would do the addition first or the multiplication. You would round off then do the other part and you would round off again so you would round off twice and therefore it is less precise than a uh, FMA instruction but they had a deviation of the results I called a uh, well, geophysicist to look at my generated spectrum and he said well I think it's right your new spectrum I can't see it wrong but it's the same for my older spectrum it's also right and not wrong so therefore he says, I think it is fine, but it is just something to be aware of that if you use new instructions or the FMA, which are more precise, then that you can get different results. Okay, Sydney, how much time? I'm done? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.